Hello there, Mr. Sutton here, bringing you the BC Calculus 7-9 Part 1 Homework Solutions on the Integral and P-Series tests. On this problem, I want to determine the convergence or divergence of this series. Now, this is one where there isn't a whole lot else that works. I mean, if you do the nth term test, this goes to zero. Uh, it's not a P-Series because we have this LN kind of muddying up the waters. So when nothing else is really working, we take a look at the integral test. Now, 1 over n ln of n, this is a uh, function that at least after n greater than or equal to 2, this is continuous, it is decreasing, it's positive, so it meets all the conditions that we need to use the integral test. So we're just going to take the integral of this thing from 2 to infinity, and if that converges, this converges, if that diverges, then this diverges. So let me set up, it's going to be an improper integral because I'm going to infinity, so I'll have the limit as b approaches infinity of the integral from 2 to b of dn over n ln of n. And this is not a straightforward integration problem. We have to actually use substitution here. I notice that I have ln whose derivative is 1 over n, um, so that definitely seems like u substitution might work and cancel out that other n. So let me let my u value be ln of n. So then du, which I have to swap in for dn, that's going to be 1 over n dn. Multiplying to get dn by itself, we're going to have n du. Next, I have to change these limits of integration to u values, because right now they're n values. So if n is 2, then we've got ln of 2 for u. If n is b, then u is going to be ln of b. Swapping all that back in there, we have limit as b approaches infinity of the integral from ln of 2 to ln of b. And instead of dn, I've got n du, and instead of ln of n, I've got u. Okay, uh, these n's are going to cancel, and now the antiderivative of 1 over u, that's just going to be ln absolute value of u, evaluated from ln of 2 to ln of b. b is still approaching infinity, we can't lose that limit. So this is ln of absolute value of ln of b minus ln of ln of 2. And now, as b actually approaches infinity, I mean, we don't really care about this other ln term, because uh, this first one is growing to infinity, no matter how many times you ln this thing. Since my integral diverges, then by the integral test, this series also diverges. For number four, we're told if limit of b, as b approaches infinity of 1 to b of dx over x to the p is finite, then which of the following has to be true? Um, so we're, we're given an integral and we're asked about a series. This is definitely invoking the integral test, which says that if the integral converges, the original series also has to converge. And if the integral diverges, the original has to diverge. So let's look at the answer choices and see what reflects that. For A, we've got the exact same expression that's in our integrand here inside the series, um, and they're saying that this series also converges. So choice A is definitely the, the best match out of any of these. Um, but before we go ahead and, and really lock that in as our final answer, let's look at the other ones just to be on the safe side. Uh, so choice B, they're saying that this would have to diverge. Well, A and B can't both be true. Um, it, it converges, not diverges, so B is false. These next ones are a little trickier. They're saying that you know n to the 1 over n to the p minus 2 converges, and then we also have n to the p minus 1. Could these converge? if this converges. They could. Um, it's all going to depend on how big that p-value is, though. right? If this was a p-value up here of 2, well, 2 minus 2 would give us a p-value of 0 up here and, and 1 down here, and those would definitely diverge by the p-series test. So these aren't necessarily true. And this last one, uh, 1 over n to the p plus 1 diverges, well, that actually has to be false. If this converges, it means the p-value is big enough to make it converge. If we have a p-value that's already bigger than 1 and we add 1 to it, we're going to get another p-value bigger than 1, which would converge by the p-series test. Um, so we've definitely eliminated all of these. Choice A is the best answer. For this problem, we're told that f is a positive continuous decreasing function and that the integral of f from 1 to infinity is 5. So we want to know which statement about the series of f from 1 to infinity has to be true. So this language here, positive continuous decreasing, this is telling us that the integral here and the corresponding series here are going to behave the same way. 
Now the key here is that this integral converges to a single number. So that means that the series must also converge. And this is again by the integral test. So we can eliminate any answer choice that says the series does not converge, like answer choice E. Now we can go a little bit further because we know that the integral test does not give us the exact value of a series. It just gives us uh, the same behavior. So any answer choices here that make claims about the exact value of our series, which is just an approximation, we can eliminate those too. So answer choice A, answer choice C, we don't know the exact value of the series. So that leaves us with B and D, which we're basically asking, does our series underestimate the true value of the integral, or does it overestimate the true value? And here it's important to realize that a series is really just a RAM of the original function. Is this LRAM or RRAM? Well, since we're starting at 1 for the, the first number we plug into our series, and 1 is where our integral begins, that means we're starting on the left endpoints of our rectangles, so this is an LRAM approximation that this series is giving us. Now, if this had started at 2 instead of 1, then we would have had RRAM. So it's LRAM. Now, this is a decreasing function. We know that LRAM is going to over-approximate on decreasing intervals, which means that this summation here has to actually be greater than the true value of the integral, greater than 5. So that's going to match answer choice D. It converges, but it's greater than 5. For this problem, they gave us the radius of convergence for this power series. They told us it was 1. They want the interval of convergence. Now, typically, if you see a series that's not geometric, and this one definitely isn't, and they want interval of convergence, you have to use your ratio test and you know get it down to absolute value less than some number. But here, they already gave you the radius of convergence, which is essentially what you're doing with the ratio test, is finding that ratio of convergence, or the radius of convergence. Um, so we can actually just start with the center and figure out the possible interval of convergence using this radius. So we have a center of 3, because we have x minus 3 in here. Since our center is 3, that means we're going 1, the radius of convergence, in each direction from 3. And that gives us at least the endpoints of our interval of convergence. So on the lower end, we have 3 minus 1, which is 2. And that's going to be less than x, which is less than 3 plus 1, which is 4. So this may or may not be the true interval of convergence, but we're at least going to have 2 and 4 in there. So that means we can at least eliminate answer choices A, B, and C. It's down to D and E. What we are going to have to do, though, is actually test the endpoints. And if you look at these two answer choices, only 2, the inequality next to that, is any different. Um, so we could really just stop after we figure out whether we converge at 2 or not. But we'll test 4 also, um, just for the sake of education. So if x equals 2, what does that turn this series into? Well, 2 minus 3 is negative 1. And if we're raising negative 1 to the second power, or really any even number, that's just going to be positive 1. So we really just have 1 over n. Now this, you hopefully recognize, is the harmonic series, which we know we can just automatically say diverges because it's the harmonic series. It's actually a p series um, with p equals 1. But we can just say harmonic diverges. So that already eliminates answer choice E then. So it's D we're looking for. But just to be on the safe side, let me test x equals 4 as well. So 4 minus 3, that's 1. 1 to anything is going to be 1. So we really just have this harmonic series all over again, which again diverges. So if our final interval of convergence, 2 less than x, less than 4, no equals. Choice D. On this no calculator free response, we're given this f of x function, this rational function, and our first task is to find the slope of the line tangent to our graph of f at x equals 3. So essentially, we just need to take the derivative of this thing and plug in 3. Well, to make my job a little bit easier, I'm actually going to move this whole denominator upstairs and put a negative 1 outside. This will save me the trouble of doing the quotient rule on something like this. And then, just using my reverse power rule, with a, or my, my power rule with a chain rule, we have negative 3, all of this stuff, to the negative 2. And then we have to multiply by the tail, the derivative of the inner function, which is going to be 4x minus 7. And now let's just plug in 3. So 
we've got a numerator and a denominator here. In my numerator, I've got negative 3. I've got this 4x minus 7 business. So this will be negative 3 and then 4 times 3 minus 7, all in the numerator. In the denominator, I just have 3 plugged into all of this stuff inside here. So 2 times 3 squared minus 7 times 3 plus 5, all raised to the second power. And this is the slope of this line. Um, I could actually just leave it like this since it's all constants. But if I wanted to simplify it, in the numerator, this is really, let's see, negative 3 times 12 minus 7. So that's going to be negative 3 times 5, or negative 15. In the denominator, this is going to be, let's see, 9 times 2 is 18, minus 21 is negative 3, plus 5 is 2. So we have 2 squared, which is 4. Um, so this is our final simplified answer. For this problem, they want us to find the x-coordinate of each critical point of f in the interval, open interval from 1 to 2.5 and then classify each of these critical points as a min, a max, or neither. All right, well, uh, I need to find some critical values for my derivative. Here is my derivative that I found from part A. This was f prime. I'm written in fraction-y form here. So critical values are going to be any values of x that make this either 0 or undefined. So I already have my numerator factored out, and I can use that in a minute to find some zeroing out critical values. But I'm going to need to factor my denominator as well. So the key to factoring this is realizing I'm going to have two squared parentheses down here. Um, and then inside each parentheses is whatever I get when I factor 2x squared minus 7x plus 5. So just using some uh, guess and check factoring know-how here, I know that my x terms have got to be 2x and x. There's no other way to get 2x squared if they both have an x in them. And then I know that my constant inside each of these has to be either 1 or 5. And they're both going to have to be negative because they multiply to a negative, or rather a positive, and they add up to a negative. So I've got negative 1 and negative 5, or negative 5 and negative 1. Well, if this is negative 1 and this is negative 5, I'd have 2 times negative 5 plus negative 1. Uh, that would be negative 11 for the middle coefficient. I don't want that. So let me try making this negative 5 and negative 1 instead. Now I've got negative 2x and negative 5x for those inner terms. Um, so that's going to end up giving me the negative 7x that I wanted. OK, so this is actually the correct factorization. And we move to finding critical values. So this derivative is going to equal 0 at whatever zeros out this numerator. If I add 7 and divide by 4, that's going to be 7 fourths which, since they have a decimal here, I'm going to turn this into a decimal just to make it easier to look at. Uh, so this is actually going to be 1.75. Now, we also have values that make this undefined. So whatever zeroes out my denominator. 2x minus 5, if that's 0, uh, then I would add 5, divide by 2. That would be 2.5 that zeroes that out. 1 zeroes out this other, frac this other uh, denominator factor. So our function is, our derivative is undefined, does not exist, at x equals 2.5 and at x equals 1. Now they asked us to find the x-coordinate of each critical value on this interval. So you actually have to say, hey, my critical point is this x value. Now 1 and 2.5, those would count as critical values, except they gave you the open interval, not including 1 and 2.5. So we can't actually call those critical values for this part of the question. The only one that actually works is this 1.75. So I'm going to spell it out. We have a critical value at x equals 1.75. The good news is that means we only have to test around this one critical value to see if it's a min or max or neither. Now one way to do this would be the second derivative test, but that's going to require a second derivative. And to be honest, I don't really feel like taking a second derivative of this thing. One was bad enough. So instead, I'm going to use sign analysis with my first derivative, which I've already got factored out. So let me make a, an f prime number line here. And I've got the endpoints of 1 and 2.5, so I don't want to pick anything outside that interval because it might mess up my results. But I have this critical value in between of 1.75. So now let me test just these two intervals here, the interval from 1 to 1.75, something in between. I'll pick 1.5. Now, if I plug 1.5 into f prime, I don't have to worry about the denominator at all 
because it's all being squared, so it's always going to come out positive. It really is then just up to this numerator. So if I plug in 1.5, 4 times that is going to give me 6, minus 7 is a negative, times the negative 3 gives me a positive. And now number between 1.75 and 2.5, let me go with 2. So again, denominator is positive, numerator you now have 8 minus 7, which is a positive, times negative 3 is a negative, so that comes out negative. And I see here that f prime is changing from positive to negative at x equals 1.75. Therefore, f has a relative max at 1.75. For this part of the problem, they're giving us this identity that our f function really equals this, these two partial fractions. Um, so that was nice of them. Based on that, they want us to evaluate the integral from 5 to infinity of f of x dx or show that it diverges. Okay. So if I'm taking the integral of f of x, I can really take the integral of this stuff. I'm also going to have to set up a limit because this is an improper integral. So a few things going on. I'm going to have this integral expressed as the limit as b approaches infinity of 5 to b. So that makes it a little bit more proper-ish. Uh, and inside now, using the f function, I'm actually going to split that up into these two fractions that they just kind of handed to me saving me the trouble of doing my uh, partial fraction dance. So I've got 2 over 2x minus 5 minus 1 over x minus 1 dx. And this is super easy now because these are both ln kind of antiderivatives. Uh, this first one would be 2 ln absolute value 2x minus 5, but we have to divide by the inner tail of 2. So this 2 goes away. You actually just have ln of 2x minus 5 absolute value. And we could probably lose the absolute value at some point because we're plugging in numbers between 5 and infinity, so that won't make this negative anyway. But moving on to this next one, this is going to be minus ln absolute value, x minus 1 initially. We're evaluating all that from 5 to b. Before I plug in b and 5, though, because I've got infinity involved, I'm thinking that if I can turn this into one ln function with a fraction, that's actually going to be easier to deal with this infinity. So using my log rules, since I am subtracting these logarithms, I can divide the stuff inside. So this is really ln of 2x minus 5 over x minus 1. And again, I'm going to drop those absolute values because if I'm plugging in numbers between 5 and infinity, I'm guaranteed I'm not taking the ln of 0 or a negative number. All right, it's time to plug in my limits of integration. So I've got ln of 2b minus 5 over b minus 1. Still have b approaching infinity now. And we also have, uh, this is going to be, let's see, 2 times 5 minus 5. That's 10 minus 5, which is just 5. 5 minus 1 is 4. So this is just ln of 5 fourths that I can turn that into. And at this point, let me actually approach infinity here. Um, so as b approaches infinity, we've got these lesser terms being forgotten about, negative 5 and negative 1. It's just 2b over b inside. Uh, that's just going to be 2 if you reduce that. So this is just ln of 2 minus ln of 5 fourths. And if we really wanted to, we could simplify that a little bit further. And that's going to be, let's see here, ln of 2. I could move in a negative 1 and do a negative 1 power and flip this to be ln of 4 fifths. So if I add that now, because I moved a negative 1 in there, I'm really just multiplying the things inside using log rules. So this is 2 times 4 fifths, which is 8 fifths, inside one big ln, and that is about as good as it's going to get. For this last part of the problem, they want us to determine whether the series with f of x in it converges or diverges, and state the conditions of the test used for determining convergence or divergence. All right, so there's two ways you could go on this one. Um, if you knew about the limit comparison test, you could compare this to... 1 over n squared and very quickly figure out what's going on with this. Um, but if you don't know about that yet, there is one other test you could use. And they, they kind of set you up for it in part C where they had you take the integral of this expression from 5 to infinity. So, so since we showed that converged, we could use the integral test to show that this converges. But before you can do that, you do need to state the conditions of the test, which is that this, this function here has to be continuous, positive, and decreasing on the interval of 5 and greater. Well, we could just state that, but let's verify it's actually true. 
So let me start by factoring this thing. And it's pretty much similar to when we factored f prime denominator. This is going to be 2x minus 5 and x minus 1 in the denominator. So now in terms of continuity, we know that we have discontinuities at x equals 1 and x equals 2.5. But that's it. Rational functions are continuous anywhere that you don't have holes or asymptotes. Um, so that means if we're working with the end value of 5 or greater, there's no discontinuities on this. But it would also be nice to verify that our function is positive after n values of 5 or x values of 5 here. So let's do a little sign analysis on just the regular f function now, just to see where this thing's positive or negative. So I've got uh, values of possible changing values of 1 and 2.5. Let me test around those. So let me pick 0 for my first number. That's going to be a negative times a negative is a positive. Let me pick 2 for the next number. This is going to be 4 minus 5 is negative. 2 minus 1 is positive. Negative overall. And let me pick 3 for the last one. That's going to be a positive, And a positive gives me a positive. So I definitely am positive for values of 5 or greater. I mean, I'm positive for 2.5 onwards. So now we move to the whole decreasing part. We're looking to verify that f prime is negative after n equals 5. So f prime line, we actually already did that sign analysis back in part b. And we saw that we were negative after 1.75 and up until 2.5. Um, but if we keep going, I mean, if you look back at that derivative and plug in something bigger than 2.5, you're still going to be making your numerator negative. Denominator was always going to be positive. Um, so this negativity just keeps going. So we verified that for x greater than or equal to 5, our f function is in fact continuous, positive, and decreasing. Um, so therefore, our integral test applies. Now back in part c, we verified that the integral from 5 to infinity of f of x dx converged. That means that by the integral test, this series involving the same exact function must also converge. For this no calculator free response problem, f is a function with derivatives of all orders where f of 2 is 7, so that's our start value. And this is kind of interesting. When n is odd, the nth derivative is 0 at x equals 2. So all the odd terms really are just not going to exist because you have derivatives at those odd terms of 0. And then when n is even and n is greater than or equal to 2, well, now we've got this formula here for the nth derivative. Um, so this is going to make everything on this problem interesting, we'll say. First thing they want us to do is find the 6th degree Taylor polynomial about x equals 2. All right, so uh, using our general formula, we've got f of 2 for our first term, and that's 7 because they gave that to us up here. Next, we're going to have f double prime of 2 times x minus 2 squared over 2 factorial. Um, so let's do our second derivative here. That's going to be 2 minus 1 factorial over 3 to the 2. And again, we're going to the second term because the first term, since n is odd, would have been a derivative of 0, so we wouldn't have to bother writing it. So this is the, uh, this piece, the derivative. But now we also need an x minus 2 squared over 2 factorial that I'm multiplying that by. Next, the third derivative is 0, so we don't worry about it. Um, the fourth derivative, we're going to have 4 minus 1 factorial over 3 to the 4th. And now the actual, the rest of it, x minus 2 to the 4th over 4 factorial. Fifth derivative is 0. Sixth derivative, we've got 6 minus 1 factorial over 3 to the 6. And then we have x minus 2 to the 6 over 6 factorial. And at this point, to simplify or not to simplify, that is the question. Whether it is nobler to make this look prettier or move on. Um, we're moving on. Because if you look further on in this free response problem, you don't actually need this Taylor polynomial for anything in the problem. So we're just going to keep going. For this part of the problem, in the Taylor series for f about x equals 2, what's the coefficient of x minus 2 to the 2n for n greater than or equal to 0? So the key on here is recognizing that this is an even power. Um, so that means that we're going to apply our even power derivative rule right here, rather than just making the derivative 0. So my coefficient of 
x minus 2 to the 2n, it's going to be all this stuff with 2n plugged in for n. That's the first piece of this. So we have a 2n minus 1 factorial up top. We have a 3 to the 2n downstairs. But now we have to be careful because we know that x minus 2 to the 2n also has a 2n factorial underneath it that comes built in. So we have to have a 2n in the parentheses with a factorial. And now you could leave it like this, and this is the coefficient of your x minus 2 to the 2n term. But if you wanted to simplify, because we actually are going to want to use this later on in a simpler form, these factorials can get reduced a little bit. So this 2n factorial has everything this factorial up here has, um, but it also has a, a 2n out in front. So if we, multi if we divide these here, I'm going to be canceling everything except the 2n that's out in front. So I'm going to have 1 over 3 to the 2n times just 2n with no factorial. On this part, they want the interval of convergence for our series for f about x equals 2. So we need the nth term to get interval of convergence. And we're only really worried about the even terms because those are the only ones with a derivative that actually exists. So the nth even term here, that's going to be the coefficient that we found in part b of x minus uh, 2 to the 2n. So that was 1 over 3 to the 2n times 2n when we simplified it. And then to get the even term, because this is just the even coefficient, you're going to have an x minus uh, 2n, or actually x, x minus 2 to the 2n up top. There we go. So now I need to use the ratio test on this. I need the n plus 1th term divided by the nth term. Absolute value, and we have a limit as n approaches infinity for all this. So let me show you the n plus 1th term. That's going to be this x minus 2 to the 2 times n plus 1 in parentheses. We'll have 3 times 2 to the n plus 1. And we'll have 2 times n plus 1 as well down here. Nth term is just all of this stuff with no modifications. Time to same change flip and reduce this a little bit before we try taking a limit. So in my numerator, I've got this term here, which I'm going to write as x minus 2 to the 2n plus 2. And also I have 3 to the 2n and 2n. In the denominator, I've got this bottom term here, which I'll write as 3 to the 2n plus 2. And I'll also write this other one as 2n plus 2 in a parentheses. x minus 2 to the 2n will also be hanging around down there. Now a whole bunch of simplifying is going to happen. With these 3s, I can subtract my exponents. So that's going to give me, uh, let's see, this would be a, a 3 squared downstairs. These 2n and 2n plus 2s are going to hang around for a little bit. With the x minus 2s, I can subtract exponents, giving me an x minus 2 squared in the numerator. Um, so up top, then, I'm left with 2n and x minus 2 squared. In the denominator, I still have a 3 squared and a 2n plus 2. All right, so as n approaches infinity, we've got basically a 2n and a 2n that are going to cancel each other out. This plus 2 here doesn't really make a difference as n approaches infinity. Um, so then all that's left is we have an x minus 2 squared up top and a 3 squared on the bottom, which is really just 9. Now by the ratio test, we know this is supposed to be less than 1. That's what makes this converge. So let's just simplify this now and solve for x to get our at least our rough draft of our interval of convergence. So we can multiply both sides by 9. And then if I square root both sides, I have absolute value x minus 2 less than 3. And now I can set up my double inequality. Um, so I can see my interval of convergence is going to come from doing negative 3 less than x minus 2 less than positive 3. Adding 2 to every side to get x by itself, I have negative 1 less than x less than 5. But I still need to check convergence at my endpoints of negative 1 and 5 because I didn't do this with the geometric test. I did this with the ratio test. And the ratio test doesn't take a stand on whether we have convergence when this absolute value stuff is exactly 1. All right, so we need to test x equals negative 1 and x equals 5. And x equals negative 1. Let's see what that does to our nth term. So at negative 1, this would be negative 3 to the 2n over 3 to the 2n times a 2n. So we could turn this into negative 3 over 3 to the 2n. 
Now this would normally give us an alternating series, um, but because this is an even exponent here, you've essentially got negative 3 over 3, which is negative 1 squared, and then raising that to the n. Um, this just comes out to 1. So really, this is all just 1 over 2n. And I can actually take a 1 half outside the series. So I can really just write this as 1 half times the series of 1 over n. Now you might recognize this is the harmonic series. The harmonic series diverges. And if you have a diverging series multiplied by a constant, it's still going to diverge. Um, so this whole series is going to diverge. All right, so let's check out the endpoint at 5 if x equals 5. Well, that one's a little easier to do. Uh, that's just 5 minus 2, which is 3 to the 2n over 3 to the 2n. So that's just going to cancel out and give us 1 over 2n. Again, you can take a 1 half out here, leaving a 1 over n inside. Again, this is the harmonic. It's, it's the exact same case that we just saw. So this diverges. So our true interval of convergence then, since we diverged at both endpoints, is actually going to be what we started with negative 1 less than x less than 5.